Odysseus is a mythical avatar of all the real-life Greeks who sailed their ships into unknown waters across the Mediterranean and Black Sea in search of new land and adventure. When he describes the Cyclops Island, he speaks with the discerning eye of the colonists. The land is not at all bad. It could produce every kind of seasonal crop. There are luxurious irrigated meadowlands along the coast by the white-topped sea, which could support vines throughout the year. The soil would be easy to plough and tall, ripe crops could always be harvested. For underneath the topsoil, the earth is very rich. There's also a very good natural harbour there. Now, many Greeks from the 8th to the 6th centuries BCE were on the move. Intrepid men left old communities in mainland Greece and on the western seaboard of Asia to form settlements far away. They created the distinctive map of ancient Greece, the join the dots network of townships strung along many coasts and islands of the entire Mediterranean and Black Sea. The Greeks exponentially increased the number of communities that they lived in and the ethnic groups that they had contact with. In Plato's Phaedo, Socrates says, the earth is very large and we who dwell between the pillars of Hercules and the river Phasis, that's the Rioni in modern Georgia, we do so in only a small part of it round the sea, like frogs or ants around a pond. Now some of the first enterprising long distance sailors around this pond traded with Almina in the estuary of the Orontes River near the modern border between Turkey and Syria. And others soon founded cities in what are now Libya, France and the Crimea, cheek by jar with Africans, Gauls, Arbirans, Thracians and Scythians. They penetrated the Black Sea even to the remote estuary of the River Don to trade with tribes who were in turn in contact even with Southeast Asia. And the Greeks usually settled near the sea, their thoroughfare and escape route. The most detailed written account of a foundation of a colony takes us to Thera or Santorini, the central Aegean island between the Cyclades and Crete. A brave man called Battus led a group of Therans to found a settlement further west in Africa than most Greeks could conceive of. The date was 630 BCE and the location of the new colony was Cyrene on the northeastern coast of Libya, which is now called Shahat. Battus seems to have left Thera because of political upheavals and shortage of land or food. In the mid-1920s, an extraordinary inscription was found by the excavators at Cyrene. The Therans swore to sail as Battus comrades and on equal terms with one another, undivided into nobility and commoners. One adult son was to be enrolled from each family and any other free man from Thera could go. They put real effort into creating a community of consenting adults committed to this enterprise. But the oath does take precautionary action against problems that might arise. If the colonist is successful, then any new colonist who joins can have his chair in citizenship and any unsigned lands. But if there are problems for five years, then the colonists can all return to Thera and reclaim their property and citizenship. The oath was ratified by an unusual ritual involving all the Therans, both those leaving and those staying behind. All of them together, it says, men and women, boys and girls. They burned wax images and cursed any who didn't uphold the terms of the treaty. Every new community had to forge relationships with the ethnic groups it encountered. That was whether they were dominantly hostile or actually quite cooperative. So the Greeks learn new languages and skills in the process. In some places, they became more acculturated to the local way of life than in others. Herodotus describes the Mexo Hellenes, the mixed Greek tribes of the Northern Black Sea. And the Greeks became expert in identifying indigenous foreign gods with members of their own pantheon, so war gods with Ares and goddesses who looked after animals with Artemis. Colonisation created many myths. Cities are founded because Greek gods fall in love with indigenous maidens or pursue them across the sea. 
Arethusa, the wild-haired nymph of the great Sicilian city of Syracuse, adorns its spectacular coins. And she was chased there from old Greece by the god of the river, Alpheus. The most westerly Greek settlement was Massalia, that's actually Marseille, where Greeks from Asia Minor imported the vine, thus inaugurating the French wine industry. Enterprising mariners from Phocaea and Asia Minor sailed west. They set up trading posts on the far distant coast of Spain. But they noticed a route which, with a natural harbour in their own estuary, and they approached the local barbarian king, Nanus of the Ligurians. He just so happened to be preparing a feast at which his daughter Gyptis would select a husband. And conveniently for the Greeks, she took a shine to one of them, Protis, and the wedding of the brave Greek sailor to the beautiful French princess thus symbolised the happy union of Greek and indigenous cultures. A common feature of the new colonies was ruled by a tyrannos, that's our word tyrant. The basic meaning was a ruler who'd seized power, usually with popular support, rather than inherited it. Aristotle said that these tyrants were dictators who rode the wave of poor people's unhappiness with their kings during economic turmoil. Because when the masses needed an articulate leader to champion their cause and remove the evil old kings and rival aristocrats, newly rich tradesmen exploited the instability. And another factor was the rise of hoplite warfare, in which the demos, the people, the mass of non-aristocrats, was increasingly a direct participant. And this fostered a new sense of entitlement amongst ordinary armed men. Shiploads of Greeks on the move around the Mediterranean Black Sea pond often included aristocrats in flight from their ancestral homelands, as well as the hungry, dispossessed and disgruntled lower classes. But the tyrants were flamboyant, ostentatious, egotistical and materialistic. They competed with each other in displays of power and wealth. The flamboyant tyrants of Corinth, for example, seized power in 655 BCE. The first of them, Kipsilus, orchestrated a very violent coup and overthrew the Bacchiad family. Now, Kipsilus was said to have worked for them previously as a military captain, and it was by winning the allegiance of the militia that he achieved total power. Once he'd become tyrant, he was protected by his own personal bodyguard. The apparent tolerance of tyrants by Greeks in Sicily has been explained as a response to the permanent threat from the Carthaginians, because they were a permanent fixture in Sardinia, and also from warlike local tribes and the Etruscans who controlled Corsica. It was to these Greek strongmen that we owe the stunning Greek architecture, which we can still see in South Italy and Sicily. The tyrants of Acragas and Syracuse built, built really extraordinary temples close to the sea. And the beautiful early 6th century temples of Hera and probably Poseidon were financed by rich Greeks at Posidonia or Paestum. A more enticing name for the period of the tyrants in the 7th to 6th centuries is the Lyric Age of Greece. This was when the foundational poets of Western personal poetry produced their songs. The poems of the 7th and the 6th centuries are full of joie de vivre, of love and pleasure, laughter and luxury. Many explore the physical and emotional effects of wine and of sexual desire, and they're very suitable for drinking parties. Some more philosophically meditate on the brevity of life, while others are far more earthy. And they're very satirical attacks on enemies. There are songs for maidens before they're married, the dirges to perform at funerals, and hymns to be sung in the temples of all the gods. Many poets of the Archaic era were Aegean islanders. The first was Archilochus, a trenchant soldier of Paros, who described himself as both a comrade of Ares and a savant of the Muses. Far from sentimental about his home island, in a famous line he derides Paros and its fig sheds surrounded by marine life. And he was just as rude about Thassos, where he was involved in establishing a colony and fighting barbarian Thracian tribesmen. He preferred a life on the move, he said, in a good ship with three sails and a smart steersman. He knew how to lead a drinking session with a song for Dionysus, his 
wits blasted out with wine as if by thunder. And in early 6th century Lesbos, another soldier poet called Alceus sang with passion and menace about his local tyrants and drinking and life on the battlefield and at sea. One poem by Alceus celebrated competitions in female beauty on his home island. And rivalry in female attractiveness is reminiscent of Sappho, these days the most famous of the Greek lyric poets, and she also came from Lesbos. Her poems reflect the island's proximity to the rich barbarian culture of Lydia, which is only 10 nautical miles away. Her child, she tells us, is a lovely girl called Cleis, and she wouldn't exchange her for the whole of Lydia. Now, Sappho is unusual because she's a female poet, but that homoeroticism in some of her works is actually unremarkable. It's elsewhere found in other women's songs related to the cults of goddesses especially those who oversaw the biological and sexual reproductive aspects of their lives, like Artemis and Aphrodite. For example, in Spartan songs sung by choruses of maidens. But that homoeroticism is also a feature of symposium poetry written by men. The age of tyrants and lyrics was when the fashion for symposia, in imitation of Eastern palace practice, swept across the Greek world. The typical symposium was a ritualised male drinking session and the wealthy began to build special rooms designed to hold up to 20 men, paired, perfumed, garlanded with flowers and facing each other on couches. And they indulged in light-hearted, sexualised, intergenerational mentoring. The young men were schooled in humour, the behaviour and manners appropriate to a leisure class clique and hundreds of ancient Greek vase paintings depict these drinking parties and there's lots and lots of cups and jugs created for them that have survived. And the very best picture is in the tomb of the diver at Pystorm. The guests are singing to a pipe, embracing their partner affectionately and playing kotabos. That's a boisterous party game in which they competed in aiming the drugs of their wine at targets. The playful atmosphere of the symposium inspired the love songs of Anacreon, another Eastern Greek, and he was resident court poet at the uh, palace of the tyrant Polycrates on Samos. He tells a Thracian filly that he needs a man to break her in and ride her. But he also sings about handsome boys who smell of hyacinth fields, the boy with a glance of a girl. He tells us that he was crazy with love for Cleobulus. And another boy, Magistus, is garlanded with willow and we hear has been on a 10-month drinking binge. Ordinary people started enjoying symposia too and they were important in newly founded colonies. Archaeologists have found many wine cups and bowls in those sites. The presiding god of the symposium, Dionysus, is portrayed on many of these vases along with retinues of revelling satyrs and minads. He's the god of arrival from the sea. Sometimes he arrives in a ship accompanied by dolphins, as on a gorgeous black figure cup proudly signed by the potter Exekias. Dionysus' white sailed ship, surrounded by glossy black dolphins, glides across the smooth terracotta surface. And in some sources, Dionysus actually rides on a dolphin himself. We've got a hymn to Dionysus in which he's captured by pirates and only escapes by changing them into dolphins. Dolphins symbolise the experience of colonists. At Taras in Sicily, the foundation hero Phalanthos was saved from drowning by a dolphin, and the coins of the town show that. In fact, dolphins appear on the coins of numerous towns, both on the mainland of Greece and in the islands and colonies. The most famous dolphin rider was Arion. Now, he worked at the court of the Corinthian tyrant Periander and he sailed to Taras to take part in a musical competition. After winning, he was thrown overboard by pirates, but a dolphin, when chanted by Arian singing, carried him to the shore at Tynarum back in the Peloponnese and there was a sanctuary of Poseidon there. The psychological connection between poetry and the dolphin is stressed by the lyric poet Pindar. He praises the work of another poet, a Sicilian one, 
because it's made him feel like a dolphin of the sea which the lovely melody of the pipes has excited in the expanse of a waveless sea. Ancient Greek sailors employed musicians to help them keep time as they rowed and actually they preferred to use the penetrating plangent music of the Ilos also played at symposia. The ancient Greek metaphor of the symposium as a voyage in a seagoing ship was produced by the connection between the symposium and colonisation. How better to cement the esprit de corps of a new community that had been together and they braved the perils of the open sea. How better than by a constructive drinking session. A house in the Sicilian city of Acragas was actually renamed the Trireme after a particular carousal. The young symposiasts became so inebriated that they imagined they were being battered by a storm while actually out at sea. And finally, they completely lost their senses and tossed all the furniture and bedding out of the house through the windows as if upon the waters. They were convinced that the pilot had actually directed them to lighten the freight on the ship because of the raging storm. A great crowd gathered and began to carry out all the jettison cargo, but the youngsters did not cease from their mad actions. So in the temporary madness of the symposium, these Greek sailor colonists of the Lyric Age drank until they became half seas over and their collective ship came in. The dolphin was also associated with two other senior Olympian gods. Um, one, of course, was Poseidon, the sea god, the grandfather of Theseus, and dolphins helped Theseus come back from the seabed on his adventure on the way to Crete. And Apollo of the dolphin, Apollo Delphinios, was worshipped in temples overlooking harbours at the extremities of every part of the Greek colonial world. In the far west at Marseille, where that Greek from Asia Minor had married the local princess, Twin temples of Apollo Delphinios and his sister Artemis stood high on the rocky headland. In the Black Sea, Apollo Delphinios was worshipped in the Milesians colonies of Olbia, Sinope and Gorgippia. One of the peculiarities of Olbia was actually that it had coins in the shape of dolphins leaping into the air with curving spines. And in fact, Olbia demonstrates the Greeks' incredible ability to adapt to new environments. It was found by Milesians on the site of the River Hippinus, that's now the bug, on the coast of the Black Sea to the west of the Crimean U Peninsula in Ukraine now. They built a temple of Apollo Delphinios to show that they were serious about founding a colony, and then they built a marketplace, a space for a political assembly to meet, a theatre, and a system of water pipes, furnishing the fountains in the city centre with continuous fresh water. But there was a problem. They could not get vines to grow there. It was too cold. It was much later that they developed a system of viticulture in the inclement climate, which could actually produce wine. Nothing daunted, they imported their wine and founded an unusually enthusiastic cult of Dionysus as if to ensure his continued approval in their vineless backwater. And the pottery found at Olbia proves that they really enjoyed symposia, in fact, just as much as any other Greek colony in a warmer climate. So the age of colonisation, the creation of Greek South Italy and the mysterious new world of the Hellenised Black Sea was also the age of lyric poetry, the distinctive voices of the islands and the symposium. It's the age symbolised by the dolphin, so closely tied to the cults of Poseidon and Apollo and Dionysus, the gods of the sea, of colonial voyages and the drinking parties enjoyed by sailors, traders and migrants. So the Greeks' mental resourcefulness and intellectual curiosity owed a great deal to the creation of that diaspora and their constant voyaging on the high seas.